We're up to mitzvah number 123. Now, last time we did mitzvah number 121, and I was really excited about mitzvah number 122, but then I started researching it, and it sounded very familiar, and then I realized that we had already done mitzvah number 122, and I looked it up. We did it in May of 2019. That's a while ago. It was lumped together with the mitzvah of not to testify falsely. So when, once we talked about not to testify falsely, we just added all the other mitzvahs that related to testimony. So as a result, we'll jump to mitzvah number 123, and that is the mitzvah of the variable sin sacrifice. So of course, we're talking about sacrifices. There's all kinds of sacrifices. And we spoke last time about sin sacrifices, but they were of the fixed variety, which means that regardless of a person's financial ability, if they are in the category of people that need to bring this sort of sacrifice, they must bring that sacrifice. And there's no allowances for people who are poorer to bring a different type of sacrifice. Mitzvah number 123 talks about certain sins that incur variable sacrifices, meaning that the type of sacrifice that a person has to bring for these sins the type depends on the wealth of the person bringing it a really wealthy person brings an animal sacrifice of course that's more, more expensive a middle class person brings a bird sacrifice which is a little bit cheaper and then the poor people bring a flower offering a meal offering which of course is the cheapest so this is a mitzvah about certain sins that incur sacrifices that are means tested depending on the person's financial ability financial wherewithal that will determine the, the, the that, that will determine the type of sacrifice that they must bring now this variable sin sacrifice only applies to four specific sins there are only four specific sins of the many sins of the torah that are in this category number 1 entering the temple while impure, of course, there are all sorts of laws of purity and impurity, and you are not allowed to walk onto temple grounds if you are impure. Even today, today it's possible to walk onto Temple Mount. You could do it in Israel, but it would be against halacha, against the law for a Jew to walk up there because we are all considered ritually impure, and thus we're not allowed to walk on those grounds, they maintain their sanctity. This is mitzvah number one of these four mitzvahs that incur a variable sin sacrifice. Number two is to eat holy food, which is like sacrifices, truma, etc., while impure. So if a Kohen is entitled to eat certain foods, certain holy foods, but the Kohen has to be ritually pure, and if they are impure, then that is a sin that incurs this sort of variable sin sacrifice. Number three, violating an oath. If a person makes an oath and they violate that oath, that's a sin that incurs this sort of sacrifice. And finally, denying under oath that you know testimony for a court case. Of course, a court case, the court is looking for evidence, looking for testimony, looking for some sort of information that will guide them in the pursuit of justice. And if there's a person who they think they're under the impression that they have testimony, that person is required to provide said testimony to the court. But if they deny under oath that they know testimony and they did it and it was untruthful, in that instance, they would have to bring a variable sin sacrifice that makes four sins that have this interesting law that it's a sin sacrifice, but it depends on the financial status of the person who's bringing that sacrifice. Now, the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we are using to navigate through the 613 mitzvahs, in every mitzvah, he offers us a reason. He calls it the roots of the mitzvah. What's a reason? What could be the theory? Why, why these four mitzvahs in particular, they have the ability, the sliding scale, where depending upon the wealth the financial ability of the person, that determines the kind of sacrifice that they bring. And he, again, repeats the reason why we have sacrifices. The reason why we have sacrifices is to remind a person and to bring to their heart 
that they made a mistake and they think about it and they do an action that's associated with trying to expiate, trying to atone, trying to rectify what they did, to realize that they violated the will of the Almighty and to try to reach out to the Almighty and seek forgiveness for what the person did. And of course, to commit to not make that same mistake again. So that's the reason why we have sacrifices. Sacrifices in general are there as a tool to help facilitate the repentance process. It's about addressing the underlying cause of the transgression, trying to fix it, and trying to prevent future instances of said misdeed. And the Almighty continues the Sefer Chinuch, in his wisdom and in his knowledge of the feebleness of man's intellect and the paucity of man's understanding and the weakness of man's strength. In these sins, the Almighty wanted to make it easier for a person to achieve atonement. And therefore, he made it contingent on the wealth of the person. And why these four in particular? It's because these sins are commonplace. These things happen all the time. These are sorts of sins that people don't realize their severity. And when you don't realize the severity of something, you're likely to do it mindlessly without thinking about it. Eh, it's not so important. Eh, it's not so harsh. Eh, it's not so severe. And then he explains. When it comes to oaths or testifying under oath, those are just words. And people don't think that words are so important. That's not an action. I didn't steal from someone. I didn't do something. I just said something. Words are just a bunch of hot air. That's what people may think. And of course, we're trained otherwise. There are many laws in the Torah that govern speech. And in fact, the defining characteristic of humanity, according to our sages, is that we are capable of verbal speech and verbal articulation. That's what differentiates us, or that's what the primary differentiation between us and animals is. And that's when a person speaks in a sinful manner, they are corrupting their humanity. But we don't think so. To us, an action, well, that's something that really is noteworthy. But speech is just words, all talk, no action. You've heard that before. And there are, because people are more likely to do these, the Almighty, realizing the fallibility, the feebleness, the weakness, the paucity of understanding of humanity, and the recognition that these are going to happen a lot, if there was a very severe punishment, a very severe sacrifice, one that was financially crippling for the less well-off, the person would just give up. And therefore, the Almighty wants people to be able to get back on track and make it easier for them to atone for these types of sins. And then he talks about impurity. Impurity, those are also sins which are quite common. Why? Because the concept of purity and impurity, it's hard for us to understand. We don't appreciate it as much. We don't see it, for example. You don't notice the difference in a person who is pure versus impure. And it's also hard to maintain. After all, when you are in a state of purity, you have to be very careful where you're walking. You walk into a cemetery. You've suddenly been rendered impure. Nothing changed in a physical way. But in the realm of existence upon which purity and impurity rests, you're now impure. And where you're hanging out, if you walk into a hospital and there's dead bodies in the hospital, you're impure. If you're touching certain things, that could convey impurity. So you really have to be cognizant of where you are and what you're doing in order to maintain your status, your state of purity. And therefore, because these things are so likely to happen, they are rife. Therefore, they might have made it easier for us to unburden ourselves from it and to atone for it and to be rectified, to be cleansed from it. 
And then he adds, there's another leniency for denying knowledge of testimony under oath. Usually when you bring a sin sacrifice, it's only when you do it when you did it inadvertently. You made a mistake. If someone does a sin willfully, wantonly, that uh, the sacrifices might not work for that. But the exception is when someone denies knowledge of testimony under oath. You have knowledge of testimony. And you're under oath. And the court asks you, do you know anything about this case? Can you illuminate this case for us? And you say no. Even if you actually do know testimony and you are aware of that, you could still get out, so to speak. You could still cleanse yourself. You could expiate yourself with just a sacrifice. And the reason why is because these sins, says the Sefer Chenuch, they're common. And we have a Yetzirah. And it seems like we have an alibi. We have some deniability. We could say, well, I lied, but can you prove it? It's really hard to get someone to say, tell the truth, right? If you can't really prove that they lied. And people could always say, well, yeah, yeah of course, I, I thought so at the time, but I forgot. It's like a deposition. Suddenly everyone forgets. Well, I can't recall. <laughs> oh, I can't recall. I can't recall. They may have photographic memory in every other area of, of life. When it comes to deposition, ah, suddenly they just forget everything. And therefore, these sins are going to happen. And also, he adds, it doesn't, doesn't feel like a major crime. It seems kind of innocuous. I don't want to participate in a judicial proceedings. Of course, there are downstream effects. You know, if a person has a case and you have evidence, you have testimony, you don't prov you don't provide it to the court, that person may lose out. They'll be mistreated. They'll be stolen from. But most people don't pay attention to that. And for these reasons, the Almighty made the reversing of this sin. He made it easier with the ability for poor people, even middle-class people, to get off cheaper, so to speak, with birds or even with a flower meal offering. Now, the way this works, the Sefer Chirach tells us, is that if a person commits one of these four sins, they must bring a female sheep or a goat, which is the kind of animal that's used for a sacrifice in this case. If they are a pauper, they get downgraded, so depending how poor they are, either to the middle class level of birds or to the lowest level of flower. And then he tells us something really interesting. Let's say there's a person who is poor. And they decide to borrow, to bed steal borrow, to be able to bring a more expensive offering. They would not fulfill their obligation because they're a poor person. And in this variable sin sacrifice, in this means-tested sin sacrifice, they have to bring what the money wants of them. And that is a cheaper, less expensive offering. This is the opinion of the Sefer Chinuch. It should be noted that the Rambam disagrees. The Rambam says that a poor, poor person is not obligated to bring a more expensive sacrifice, but if they do, they have fulfilled their obligations. But it's really interesting. The Sefer Chinuch explains his rationale. What's the rationale? Why a poor person cannot get off the hook by bringing a more expensive sacrifice in the event that they are allowed to bring a cheaper sacrifice? That is inappropriate. The Almighty is telling you, I want less from you. I'm trying to alleviate your circumstances. I don't want you to bring a more expensive sacrifice. I want to go easy on you. It is improper, it's inappropriate for a person to reject the Almighty's alleviation of your circumstances. And then he adds, which is a good lesson then, a good lesson today, in general, learn this lesson. Don't try to spend more than you can afford. Live within your means. Don't develop Tastes for things that are out of your price range. It's amazing that this is what he wrote 700, 800 years ago. And until today, people are always looking at the neighbor's car and the neighbor's house and 
their fancy jewelry or their the newest iPhone or whatever it is. It's an important lesson. Don't get into debt. Don't develop tastes for things that are just too expensive. Live within your means. Because otherwise, he cautions us. It could be a cause for people doing things that are wrong, that are unethical, like stealing. If you develop an expensive habit and you grow a dependency to it, that needs to be filled. You don't want to downgrade. It's very hard for a person to downsize. So once you move up, you got to make sure that you can sustain that because otherwise you may be impelled to do things that are wrong just to maintain your standard of living. Now we just did our, we're still in the middle of it, uh, our fundraiser, as you know, and I was chatting with some friends as we do during the fundraiser, we call up our friends, find out if we can count to their support at givetorch.org. So I was chatting with my friend named Selwyn, and he told me something so beautiful, I have to share it with you. The optimists say that the glass is half full, and the pessimists say, well, no, it's half empty. Our people, Jewish people, we disagree with both of them. The glass is not Half full, it's not half empty. It's the wrong glass. If your glass is half full, that means you have to get a smaller cup. You have to realize that your glass is full. It is full. It's just for whatever reason, you don't have to measure yourself against your neighbor. If they have a very large glass and their glass is full, and your glass is only half empty, but if you're using the neighbor's glass, got to get your own glass. And you have to know that the Almighty gives you whatever you need to succeed. And if it's less than your neighbor has, okay, that's fine. That's fine. And we don't know why the Amai does what he does. But your glass should never be half empty. It's always full. And you know what? Sometimes that demands that you get a different glass. It was a very powerful, powerful idea. Our life is always full. Our tools are always there for us to do what we need to do. And we don't just measure ourselves with the standard of other people, as if everyone has the same glass and some have full and some have empty and some have half. No, everyone's full. But everyone has a different glass, which I thought was very insightful and uh, relevant, of course, to this idea. Now, what about the following case? Someone was wealthy and they did one of these four sins that incur a variable sin sacrifice. So they set aside money, they designate money, for an expensive sacrifice. After all, they are a person of means and they're capable to pay whatever it takes for the more expensive sacrifice. But then the recession hits or they lose their assets and they become impoverished. They haven't yet brought the sacrifice. What do they do now? So if they've designated the money to buy the sacrifice, then they can take that money and now designate it for a lower level sacrifice, birds or flour, whatever is fitting for them. And the rest of the money they can use for non-sacred uses to pay the mortgage, to pay their bills, whatever it is. Of course, once they designate an animal as a sacrifice, that confers holiness of a sacrifice upon that animal and they would not be able to reverse that. That animal must be offered as a sacrifice. So that would apply from the highest class, the rich person sacrifice, to a middle class, and the middle class from, uh, from there to a lower class, to the lowest class, to the pauper's sacrifice of flour. Same thing would be vice versa. If a person is poor, and they got a windfall, thank the Almighty. They can add money now and buy an animal sacrifice now to be commensurate with their capacity. This is the law of Mitzvah number 123 for a variety of sins relating to oaths and to purity and impurity. These four, there is this concept of a variable sin sacrifice. Now, there is a beautiful Ramban in his commentary on the Torah on these mitzvahs in the beginning of the book of Leviticus. 
he gives a very interesting rationale as to why these particular sins have this leniency. Oaths, he tells us, these are less severe sins. These are sins that do not incur the punishment of kares when done intentionally. And therefore, of course, they are more lenient sins. In general, they have this leniency that you can offer a sacrifice that's cheaper than maybe the standard if you cannot afford it. And then he says something very interesting. He says, with regards to purity, either entering the temple or eating holy foods while impure. There's a different reason why these particular sins may incur a leniency because the person is erring. Yes, they are. But they're erring in a mitzvah matter. They want to do a mitzvah. They want to go to the temple. The coin wants to eat the sacrifice. Their intent, their motivation is noble is righteous, is for the sake of heaven. And therefore, even though they sinned, yes, it's true, the Torah made their repentance easier. Which I thought was a very nice idea, that the Almighty takes into account a person's kind of general attitude, general motivation. Yeah, you may have made a mistake, but you tried to do something right. Therefore, the Almighty will go, in that case, the Almighty will go easier on you and your ability to disencumber yourself from that situation will be made more easy. Now, it is important to note, just for the sake of clarity, that there are two other instances when a variable sacrifice is brought, not a sin sacrifice, but a sacrifice, and that is by a matzora, which is a person who gets a skin ailment of a spiritual origin, and a yoledes, which is a woman who gave birth. These are not sin sacrifices, and of course, we will get to them in due course in our study of the 630 mitzvahs, but this is mitzvah number 123, the variable sin sacrifice, sin sacrifices that are means tested depending on the wealth of the person. Let's pause for questions.